you a simple question it's not 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 a hard one but it's a it's just a simple question the question is this for us how is your heart to serve is it beating for the cause of Christ Jesus is. He's Jesus in the flesh. 
And we've come all this way now. John has walked with Jesus for three and a half years. And in John chapter 13, we find this setting, and we begin in verse number one. It says, it was just before the Passover festival. So, there are, there are several important feasts. The Passover happens to be probably the most important one to the Jewish culture. Uh, it's their time that they remember getting freed by God out of slavery for over 400 years. They were slaves in Egypt, and God did those those uh, miracles, the, the, the plagues on Egypt. And the last one was the death of the firstborn. And the Passover was how he would mark the homes of those who were uh, the followers of Christ, the followers of God. They would put the blood on the doorpost, which was a symbol of Jesus Christ down the road. We know that. They didn't know it back then. But <clears throat> the Passover was their celebration. And so it was one of the few commanded, mandatory celebrations they had to, they had to observe. And so Jesus... Uh, he's already entered into the, uh, the Passion Week. He's come in on, on, on uh, Palm Sunday. And now he's, he's at that time where he's getting ready to go into this upper room. And that's what he's saying here. It's just before the Passover festival. And notice this, verse 1. He says, Jesus knew. Now, you're going to see this word knew or know pop up several times. And it is such an important understanding in chapter 13. If you pass over that word and just go like, yeah, yeah, I know what that's all about. It's... This is the key to understanding what's going on here in this chapter. It says that Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now, that whole Jesus and the hour thing, John uses this terminology. It's, 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 it helps us, if you read through the Gospel of John, you're going to see over and over again, John using this terminology for Jesus Jesus said at multiple times when people ask him to do things or um, ask certain, um, certain questions of him, he would respond saying, my hour is not yet. My hour is not yet come. It's not yet my hour. And so here we go through this whole uh, passage and all of a sudden we come to chapter 13 and Jesus says, uh, John writes down that Jesus knew. He knew it was his time. He knew it was his hour. It was the hour and he knew certain things about that hour. We'll come back to that. Verse number two goes on to say, the evening meal is in progress. Now, background to what's going on here, we've got 12 disciples. One of them is Judas Iscariot. You can say boo on that. Come on, give me. You guys can need to be more interactive. Come on. <laughs> Judas Iscariot. <laughs> yeah, he's the villain, right? We all know that. Um, but really, there was more than one villain in the room that night because all the disciples were acting like you're teenage kids. Okay? You guys got teenage kids? You know what they are. Right? Like they fight. They can't get along. They're arguing about something. That's what the disciples were doing that night. In fact, they do it all the way through. And what were they arguing about? They were arguing about, hey, Jesus, who's the greatest amongst us? Could I sit on your right-hand side? I want to be the best. I want to be number one. In fact, two of the guys even got their mom involved. How, how can grown men do that? But two guys, James and John, actually go get mommy and get mommy to ask if they can be on Jesus' right hand side. Jesus tells us, no, can't do that. But anyway, that's what's going on. So you've got a little tension in the room, even though it's this festival, this feast. They were used to doing this multiple times. So this, was, this wasn't something new. This was an old tradition for them. But things were, not, things were not settled in the room. And it says the evening meal is in progress. And the devil had already prompted Judas, <coughs> that is the son of Simon of Scary, to betray Jesus. And so, uh, Satan, uh, Satan's already got Judas to commit. He's already taken the money. He's ready to do this thing. He's just looking for opportunity, and the opportunity is going to be this night. For some reason, it was this night that he decided it was going to happen. So, Judas is all set to do this thing. Verse 3 says that Jesus, well, there's that word again, Jesus knew, he knew that the Father had put all things under his power. Now, if you read Matthew chapter 28, you know that Jesus at the end, when he when he commissions the church, he says, hey, all power has been given unto me. Jesus already knew this. He knew that he had all power. And it's important that you know it here before he's crucified, because Jesus knew that the Father put all things under his power. What was important about that? Well, he's going to be crucified. And what needed to be under his power? Hey, life and death need to be under his power. And that's the good thing here. That's the hope we have. And it says that he had come from God and he was returning to God. So he knew where he came from, knew where he was going to. So, <laughs> verse number four, it says, So he got up from the meal, that is, uh, uh, Jesus, got up from his meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist, which was sort of odd, because Jesus uh, isn't just one of the group. Jesus is the centerpiece of the group. Why? 
He is the rabbi. He is the teacher. He is the master. He is the leader. The rest of these guys are all disciples. They knew that. They weren't under any impression that they were all equal. Jesus was the leader of this group. And all they didn't have fancy shoes. They had poor sandals at best, some leather coverings. But the roads were all dirt. Um, I, I've taken several trips to, the, to Africa. And, and you go out walking in these places that are Middle East. Is there's animal droppings everywhere, and you're walking around. You're not boots to cover up your feet. You're in, you're in sandals that are dirty, and, and there's stuff everywhere, and so you're probably stepping in it all the time. And so Jesus gets up and he begins to wash his disciples' feet. It almost gives the indication that some of these guys didn't even have on shoes. They did the barefoot thing, and that's cool for some of us that live in modern times. But think about it back then. They're stepping in all kinds of feet. Yeah, I know. No, this was huge because he's the number one guy. Remember, Jesus had rode in on a, on a, on a donkey just a couple days before, and everybody had bowed down and said, Hosanna, Hosanna. You know, they praised him. He's the conquering king, is what they said. And now he's standing there with a towel around his waist, waist washing feet. But it's going to lead to a problem. Verse 6 tells us he came to Simon Peter. Simon Peter's always the problem. Now, I say that, and, and, and there's some humor about it, because Simon Peter is always the guy saying something. But realize this. Simon Peter is the spokesman for the disciples. Each disciple had their own little um, niche that they fit into. Simon Peter was the leader. He was probably the leader, most likely, because he was the oldest of the disciples. He was far older than any of them. In fact, it's, it's funny, the, uh, the acquaintance of Peter and John. John was the youngest, Peter was the oldest. And these two guys seem to be the closest, some of the closest people to Jesus. But he comes to Simon Peter, and Simon Peter always said things. Sometimes they were great, sometimes they were awfully dumb. That's just how it is. And so I, I relate a lot to how Simon Peter thinks, because I say a lot of dumb stuff sometimes. It says, he came to Simon Peter and said to him, this, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Simon Peter's a genius, isn't he? The guy's been washing feet, he's got a towel, he's got a bowl of water, and he looks at Jesus and says, are you really going to wash my feet? Now, he wasn't really questioning whether Jesus was going to do that. What he's saying is, you're not really the one who should be doing this. He's saying, you, you're not the person who should be washing feet. You're the Lord. Listen, that's that first word. Lord. Lord, are you really going to wash my feet? This is below you, is what he said. This is so far beneath you. Somebody else should do this. This is not something that we see the king of the universe doing. This is not something that we're going we're to think that the Lord God Almighty, the Messiah, the Christ, should be doing. Are you really going to wash my feet? That's what Jesus says in verse 7. It goes on, Jesus replied, You do not realize... And I love this because Jesus is so forward thinking. You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. And for Peter, he was much later, but Peter did get it finally. And, and they're having this discussion which leads to even further. He ups it one more in verse number eight. No, Peter said. No. Man, he told Jesus no. No. You shall never wash my feet. And that's that double negative in, the, in the, the, the original languages that gives it the hardest meaning. He was being very forceful of Jesus. And, and, and that's a tone that Jesus usually didn't take much to. But Jesus, he was ready for the answer. And he says, hey, you know what? Unless I wash you, you have no part in me. And he's giving us this whole idea about the cleansing of salvation here as we go through this. But we'll keep moving on. Verse number 9. Then, Lord, this is Peter realizing what's going on. Then, Lord replied, uh, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And, and, and he's going through this whole, like, and it sounds, doesn't it sound so, that sounds so religious. It sounds so good. <laughs> and he's wrong again. How? Huh? What? He's asking for Jesus to do more cleansing? And Jesus says no. In fact, verse 10, Jesus clarifies. It says, Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet, but their whole body is clean. And you are clean, speaking of Peter, though not every one of you. And that's going to be a direct reference to, uh, to Judas Iscariot. So he's speaking in, in, in things that they, they didn't quite understand. Verse number 11 goes on, For he knew who was going to betray him, that is, Jesus already knew this, he'd already figured it out. 
And that's why he said not everyone was clean, because obviously Judas wasn't. He had the devil in him. Verse number 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. And that's, Jesus wraps it up, thinking, oh, it's over. Except for he makes this profound statement in the second half of that verse. He says, do you understand? Do you understand what I've done for you? Do you understand what I've done for you? And I think this is a question that we have to process today. As we look through this, we have to ask ourselves, do you really get what Jesus was doing that day? Do you really understand what he meant? Because you know what? I know a lot of churches. You know, there are churches I know that they have added foot washing as a church ordinance. And if that's what they want to do, that's great. It's not really an ordinance of the church because it wasn't the command to do. Not in that specific way. What Jesus wanted us to understand is deeper than just washing some feet. Which, thank, thank Jesus for that one. You know how I feel about feet. But the question we have to ask ourselves today... Hey, we've gotten off our donkeys last week. This week, do you understand what Jesus is doing when he washes feet? Do you get it? Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked it. And that's such an important question. And that's the question, keep asking that as we go through today. Do I understand what Jesus has done for me? Do I understand what he's done for me? Because if we understand what he's done for us, then it's going to change everything about us. And that's the truth. Verse 13, we'll continue on. He says, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so. And that was, that was rabbi would be teacher, Lord, and, uh, you already saw Peter call him that. For that is what I am. He was teacher, he was Lord. Now, now that I, your Lord and teacher, those are the titles you gave me, those are the ones I'm accepting. Now that I, who have, that means I'm a cut above you guys. I am higher than you, I outrank you. Now that I've done something that's beneath me, and washed your feet. You also should wash one of those people. And when he says that, does he really mean I'm going to get down and scrub some toes? No, if you ask that question, do you really understand what I've done for you? Do you really understand? Do you get it? He goes on in verse 15. He says, here it is. I have set you, I have set you an example. So that takes us off the hood. In case you were thinking, boy, we did miss one of the, the, the commands. We're supposed to be watched feet. No, he says, I've set for you an example. That you should do as I have done for you. Did you get that? Do as I have done. Everybody say that with me. Do as I have done. Wow. What did Jesus really do? That's the question that we're still asking. Because that was the question he, he, he said, hey, do you know what I've done for you? Do you get it? Verse 16 says, very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master. Nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. And that's so important. You're not above him. You're not better than Jesus. You're not better than what God did for us. But he finishes out, and this is the key verse to understand the whole thing, verse 17. He says, <coughs> no. <laughs> All right, now, now that you know these things, now that you know these things, you will be blessed. Here's our word, isn't it? You'll be blessed if you do that. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed. Jesus is basically saying, and we wouldn't, there again, we probably wouldn't use the word blessed as much, well, churchy people do, but normal vocabulary, if you're talking to your friends outside the church, you wouldn't say blessed probably as much as you'd say, you'll be happy, happy, content, you'll be peaceful, you'll be satisfied if you do that. And Jesus here, in this passage here, he gives us, in verse 17 especially, that verse, just take a good look at that verse in which you understand that Jesus is separating the difference between knowing something and doing something. And like I said last week, hey, we don't need to know anymore. So guess what we need to do? Do it. Yeah, thank you, right? Just do it. See, the key thought today is this. Serving leads to the path of blessing. And that is so countercultural. Serving leads to the path of blessing. That's what Jesus is teaching us here. Serving leads to the path of blessing. Are you kidding me? That I thought the path of blessing led me to buy a lottery ticket. I thought the path of blessing got, meant I needed more stuff. I thought, the, hey, I would be blessed if I received more. And remember what Paul told us. Jesus' words was, it's better to give than to receive. 
And Jesus isn't really talking now about money anymore. Because he's showing us it's not about stuff. Because remember, in one of the weeks we talked about this, that Jesus, in week two, we, we talked about the fact that Jesus regards money, the material wealth of this world, as not very, it's nothing. It's not even the stuff that's really good, true riches. That's how Jesus viewed it. See, what Jesus is saying here to us and to these disciples was so important. Serving leads to the path of blessing. And that, hey, oh, that's good. I, I do that. But is it? Because our problem is, and this is definitely the problem, everything in our culture points to this, that if you want to be happy, that's our word, blessed. If you want to be blessed, you can put it, blessed there instead of happy. If you want to be happy, be self-indulgent. It's true. That's what the culture is telling us. And, and that seems to be okay with us, right? Hey, that means I get more stuff this Christmas. Whose birthday is it? I'm getting so much stuff. See, yeah, it, gets, it gets quiet on those things, doesn't it? If you want to be happy, the culture says, have more stuff. Have the newest vehicle. Have the biggest house. Have the biggest income. Have the biggest whatever. You, you fill the blank with whatever it is that you think is so important. Have more. Have more. Have more. And Jesus says, no. The path to having a happy life, a blessed life, is through serving others. And that's the problem. See, <clears throat> everything in the culture points to that. If you want to be happy, be self-indulgent. But here's the problem. At the end of pursuing self-indulgence, the only thing you have left is you. That's why you go to the most wealthy people in our planet. And they just talk about having more. But they have no relationships. They have no reward. They have no happiness. That's why they have to self-medicate with alcohol, with drugs, with with illicit sex, with things like that. That's why they're looking for those things. Because they don't know what true worth is. And that might be you today. I hope not. But we have found that, hey, you know what? Self-indulgence, the bottom line is me. <laughs> you know, you'll live for you and you go, ha uh, go after the things that make you happy. At the end of all this, pursuing... Myself, it makes me happy if I have another toy to play with. Another trophy to mount. Another experience to thrill me. Right? And then we have to ask ourselves at the end, where is this taking me? Where is this left me? Because it's always going to be more. See, the adrenaline has to go higher every time. to satisfy. It's going to lead me to a bigger experience and more. More. There's got to be something more. And that's not what Jesus said. Verse 17, Jesus says, Now that you know, you already know, you know these things. For three and a half years, we've talked about all the things you need to know. If you know these things, you know that service is more important. You know that you should love your neighbor as yourself. You know that you should even love your enemies. It's not about knowing. You'll be blessed if you do that. Jesus gives us this whole understanding here. That word blessed means happy, but it's the idea of God's favor. See, we talk about being happy or being content, being blessed with stuff. And in the Bible, when they use that word blessed, they didn't think about being blessed with stuff. They thought about being favored by God. That would be a better way to put it. So what Jesus is saying here to his disciples, they clearly understood it. Now that you know the secret to all these things, the secret of service... Generosity, an eye of generosity, a heart of generosity, being shrewd with an eye to the future. Now that you know all these things, you will find the favor of God if you actually do them. Which says there's some kind of disconnect. Jesus is admitting there's a disconnect between his followers and actually doing things that they know to do. See, there's a pattern of knowing and doing with Jesus. Jesus, if you didn't catch that, that's what the whole lead up to verse 17 is all about. Over and over again, we, I, I highlight the word know or knew. Jesus knew who he was. He was confident in who he was. He was confident in his identity. As he's going to face his execution, actually that night, as he's facing his betrayer, and think about this, as he took that basin of water, 
he washed the feet of the guy who's going to walk up to the guards, to the priests, and say, hey, I can betray him tonight. Jesus washed those very feet that led to the garden of Gethsemane. And, and if I was me, I'm just telling you, I would have done something like, oops, I accidentally poured it on him. I would have done something. I probably would have done more than that if I knew this guy was going to betray me. But Jesus did it. There's no indication that Jesus did anything different to Judas than he did to Peter, James, John, and the other disciples. See, Jesus knew who he was, and he was confident in that. He knew that he was from God, and he was returning to God, is what he says earlier in this chapter. And so there was no, there was no problem with his identity. And we live in a culture where I know people are going to talk about gender identity. That's not what I'm talking about. Christians have identity issues. We don't know who we are in Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, hey, you know what? Know who you are, and then do who you are. Not do you. That's the world's view. Do God. Do Jesus. Do the servant thing. Don't do you. That's the cry of the world today. And what we find here is this disconnect that really drives us to a point uh, where I would say it like this. The difference between the truth you know and the life you live is the amount of pain you experience. (laughs) That'll take you a minute to direct your mind around this. The difference between the truth you know and the life you live is the amount of pain you experience. Right? The truth I know, that a greasy cheeseburger from Cable's Diner is so good. If you haven't been there, it's hard to get in there now. But it's thank you, Seth. We're, thank you, Seth, for introducing me to that. I'm telling you, that's the truth I know. <clears throat> but I also know this truth about it. That greasy cheeseburger is not good for me. Okay? But the life I live is, I'm hungry, I don't want to cook, so let's go down to Cable's and get one. Right? But the difference between knowing the truth and living the life I live is the amount of pain I experience. Painful when I have to go to the doctor because I didn't follow his plan. Painful when I have to get more medications. Painful when I don't do the right thing. And yet, that's a simple thing we know about in our lives physically, but it works the same way spiritually. See, some of you guys, the truth you know is that there are sins that you're living in. There are things you're not doing that you're supposed to be doing, and you're making it okay, and you know the truth of God's Word, and you stand here every week and talk about it, and yet the life you live is disconnected. Yeah, but that's okay. And we make excuses. And you know what? Every day you go through a mountain of pain that you're experiencing. It's that discomfort. It's what keeps you up at night. And we make all kinds of excuses why we can do this thing. But the difference between the truth you know and the life you live is the amount of pain you experience. And Jesus is saying, hey, don't just know more truth. Start living the truth you know. And in this context, what is the truth we know? It is more blessed to give than to receive. It's more blessed to serve. The path path to the blessed life is through serving. And that's what he's doing. In fact, he tells us the key to the blessed life is really this, applying what we know. And you're thinking, oh, those guys were just dumb, weren't they? They're the guys that wrote this. You know, we sit back and we criticize the disciples for not doing it right, and yet they're the guys that penned these words. They're the guys that actually founded the church. They're the guys that got this movement that we now have in our trust. They've got it going. They're the guys that the Bible says flip the world upside down. (laughs) And are we really going to criticize them? When what would they say about us and what we've done? I would hate for Peter, James, John, some of those guys to stay here today. After they flip their world upside down and they go, hey, what is Mabel doing? What have you done lately? You're patting yourself in the back. And you know what the key to it is? Applying what we know. And what do we know? That's the question. Two things we know about this passage. Number one, we know Jesus was a loving, humble servant. When you look into this passage, it's obvious. Jesus was a loving and humble servant. And you don't even have to be a Christ follower to, to, after you read this, to go, yeah, I get that. 
Jesus washed the very feet of people who were going to betray him. Jesus served them. Jesus did everything he could to help Judas. Nothing just went against Judas. Jesus didn't call him out. Jesus didn't make fun of him. Jesus didn't put him down. Jesus didn't even judge him. Hmm, we could take some cues from Jesus, couldn't we? He served the most evil and vile person that I can ever think of. The God who actually literally betrayed him. Jesus did it with a smile. And he didn't make him any different than any of the other disciples. From the very least to the very uh, the greatest in that group, Jesus was loving and humble if he served them. And when we look at this, what we have to realize is, is the application for this is that we serve others in a loving and humble way because we need to live a life that's marked by service, not by what we're probably known for. Think about that. Number two, the second thing we find in this passage is that we know that Jesus cleanses completely. <laughs> Go back to the statement there. Jesus is washing disciples' feet, and he washes them all, and then he comes to Peter, and Peter says, no, don't wash mine, it's below you. And Jesus says, if I don't, then you're not one of mine, which is a great teaching sidestep here. And Peter says, well, then wash all of me. I need a whole bath. And Jesus says, no, it's not bath time. Let's not get carried away. You're already clean. I just have to wash your feet. And what he's saying here is he's saying, hey, you know what? My salvation, and by the way, for all your friends who believe they have to keep getting saved over and over again, there's, there's, some, uh, there's some pretty bad uh, theology there. Jesus is saying, nope, nope. Once you trust me, we're good to go. You just need to make sure every once in a while you clean up your feet. Every once in a while, walking around in this dirty world, you've got to get your feet clean. That's what we have to do. And we know Jesus can cleanse us completely. And that's what's great about it. Because he's telling them here, hey, you know what? I cleaned everybody who wanted to be clean. He makes that exception. Because he knew Judas was in the room. Hey, I cleaned everybody who wanted to be clean. Though some didn't want it. But I've offered it out there. I have automatically given you this. Jesus has given us this picture of what he's going to do. Because in the next hour, Judas is going to walk into the garden with dirty feet now. It's not dirty with, with the, the, the dirt of the world. It's dirty with the sin of betrayal. It's a different kind of dirt. It's dirty with the rejection of Jesus Christ. You realize there's only one sin that sends you to hell. It's not the sin of homosexuality. It's not the sin of alcoholism. Premarital sex isn't the sin. Those are all bad things, but... It's the rejection of Jesus Christ as God Almighty and sacrificing neighbors. That's, right. That's the only sin that will send you to hell. Right. And when we say no to him, the Bible says the person who says no to God is a fool. There's nothing greater in your life than, than being brought to the family of God. And Jesus says, hey, you know what, Peter? You don't need a bath. I've already cleansed you. Just need to keep your feet clean. Just need to do some simple maintenance every once in a while. And that's the truth. Jesus cleanses completely. And that means we need to learn to serve others in this loving way, but we also need to tell them the truth that salvation is necessary for their life. It really is. See, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, the Apostle Paul made this, this statement. He said, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that means you've been cleansed. If anyone's in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. And notice he, he's celebrating that. We're not the same as we used to be. And that's what he's saying. Peter, you've been cleansed. You're part of the group. You're in. And that helps us understand. So we need to not just seek to serve, but we also have to pursue humility and holiness. Closeness with God. Which brings us to the point today. Here it is. Humility and holiness are the keys to the blessed life. <laughs> humility and holiness are the keys to the blessed life. Wait a minute. I thought it was about me. No, Jesus says it's not about me. The path to the blessed life is a path of service. So it's humility and holiness that gets you there. And, and it's not holy because we're going to do something in our lives. It's holiness because we're pursuing the God who cleanses us completely. Humility by serving. That's the key to this. Personal happiness isn't your goal. If you thought that was your goal, then you're going to have this life that's never happy, never satisfied. Always looking for the next thing. You, hey, just turn on, turn on Facebook sometime. That's all they do. 
people are out there. I've got this plan for you. Like, hey, you want to you get rich quick? You want to get healthy quick? I can, I can have you lose weight. I can have you gain riches. I can do this. And they promise us, you know what they're doing? They're trying to get you to go after the you, to satisfy you. But you know the true happy life is knowing who you are in Jesus Christ. Humility and holiness are the keys to the blood side. So the question I have about what Jesus has taught us here in this passage is, as we go forth this week, who can I serve? Who can I serve? If I want to be more blessed, and we all said that at the very beginning, the question you should be asking is, who can I serve this week? Now, who can serve me? Now, how can I share my emotions all over the internet? How can I rant rave? How can I pour me everything? Who can I serve? Who can I take my eyes and focus them on? Who is the person outside my life that I can really serve? And how can I take steps towards a closer relationship with Jesus Christ, towards that holiness in Him? <clears throat> Two days ago, my wife and I were out in Greensboro, and uh, we were walking, uh, we were walking in, getting ready to go in somewhere, and uh, my wife had already spotted him, but there's a guy approached us. And I knew what exactly was going to happen as it happened. He stopped me, and he began his sad story. And inside of me, my mind was shouting, No, he doesn't deserve your help. No, he's going to use it to buy drugs. I mean, that's just the honest truth. He looked like he had been on some drugs. He had the teeth of a drug addict. He just, and he's telling me a sad story. Now. Inside me, everything that I'd been taught by religion and by traditional Christianity and church was saying, don't help him, he's not worthy. We went through this last week, so if you're not sure about what, what the true answer is, watch last week. And I sat there, I started to say something. In fact, he asked me if I had any money, and I started to say, I started to lie. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna lay it all out here. I started to lie, and before you judge me, you probably didn't say anything. I started to say, I don't have anything. And I knew I had money in my wallet. And I didn't say anything. By the way, this is enough to pat myself in the back, I'll tell you, because I'm admitting my sins. I pulled out my wallet, I shake my head, because I was shaking my head, not really at him, I was shaking my head because I, mean, I, I preached on this last week. I've been preaching on it for three weeks now. I reached on my wallet and pulled out a $20 bill and gave it to him. And as I'm giving it to him, I feel like my hand was shaking because I was like, oh, he's going to go out and buy something that you buy. And now I just think about the sermon I was going to speak today. And I want to say, man, I can't stand before my congregation and act like a hypocrite. But if you think, hey, that was good that he gave that money up, it wasn't good. Because everything within me was wrong. Everything within in fact, the first thing I did when my wife and I was we walked by, the first thing I said is I did it all wrong. My heart was all wrong. I, yeah, I gave him the money, big whoop. I didn't really serve him, though. Everything was all wrong. And I did it because I knew I had to, but I wasn't being a cheerful giver. Because I was thinking about how that money would have served me better than him. Would have bought me more pleasure than him. At least the right kind of pleasure. I could have bought a good Bible book. I could have done something good. I could have dated my wife for that $20. I was thinking about me. And I was living the life that I shouldn't be lived. And you know what? I was miserable. It had nothing to do with humility or holiness. God still allowed me to give that money even though I wasn't doing it the right way. You know, the question we should be asking ourselves is why is God blessing us? Not so we can tight fist and hold on to it. The true life of Christ is life with an open hand. An open hand towards helping our brothers, helping people that aren't anything like us. See, there was a set of disciples one time that sat at the table with Jesus that night and saw him wash their feet. And they went out and turned the world upside down. Because they understood it is more blessed to give than to give. And they wanted a better life. And that better life came to you and to me. Because those guys were willing to turn the world upside down. And they served us by 
laying their lives on the rock for us. They served us by giving us the word of God to serve for us. They served us by dying martyrs' deaths. You know what they tell you? They tell you and me the struggles you think you have are nothing. We are so grateful to have been counted worthy to suffer in the name of Jesus Christ because it is more blessed to give than receive. We're getting ready for our Lottie Moon offering. For some of you guys, you may not even know what that means. That means we're getting ready for our international missions offering. We do two major offerings a year. Uh, a North American missions offering and a foreign uh, international missions offering. And, and I always thought, man, what a, what a horrible time of year to do a Christmas offering. You know why I think like that? Because this time of year, nobody wants to give any money because they want to buy stuff for themselves and their family and friends. But let me give you the practical challenge this year. This year, how about we make Christmas about Christ? See, Jesus took that whole issue of giving to the fullest extent where he stood on, on a cross. And he said, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. And he didn't just say it, he did it. He bled and died for us. Three days later, he came out of that tomb and conquered death. For us to have a place to go, a home in heaven, in the presence of God, that's what he gave us. But 2,000 years later, we celebrate his birthday by giving ourselves things. Widescreen TVs, better clothes, bigger gifts. So let me challenge you this year. When it comes down to it, would you give more to God this year than you give to yourself and your family and friends? That would be a certain attitude. Would you give more to God than you do to yourself? Because it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. For most of us in this room, that's, that's a tough thought. That <clears throat> we say we're Christ followers. But the true Christ followers of that first century, they did things that were unbelievable. They gave until it literally hurt. They gave and they were beaten. They gave and they were stoned. They gave and they were crucified. They gave and they were tortured. We give out of our convenience. But the reason they gave is because they saw the greatest gift ever. And that was Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins. If you're here today or you're watching online, <clears throat> online and you don't know Jesus Christ your Savior, I'm not asking if you've joined a church. I'm not asking if you, if you gave money. I'm not asking if you... Hey, you know, hey, I, I, I was baptized. I'm not asking about any religious activity. I'm asking today, if there was a point in time in your life when you bowed your head and you accepted Jesus Christ in your heart, when you, when you made Jesus Christ the number one person in your life, if you haven't done that, then today's the day. You're not promised another, another minute so we urge, we plead with you. It's the most important thing you can do is to know Jesus Christ. In just a moment, we're going to have a verse of invitation. Hey, if you don't know Jesus Christ, I'll be here. Tracy's up here. Come find one of us. If you're watching online, hey, what we want you to do is contact us. We'd love to take the time to show you out of God's Word. Not what I say, but what God's Word says, how you can know Jesus Christ for Savior. Most of the people, though, in this room, Probably most of the people watching online say they're Christ followers. And we're getting ready to have an easy chance to see what kind of Christ follower we are, really are. Sacrifice. Serve someone else. Serve Jesus' Jesus's plate. See, Jesus died so that others could come to live. Live an eternal life. And he asked his people, that's us, his church, his followers, to go out and tell people about this. So that's our first job. Who can we tell? Who can we serve this week by telling them about Jesus Christ? 
When was the last time you actually told somebody, a non-Christian, about Jesus Christ? Number two, hey, Christmas has come, like I said. There's no better way to celebrate Jesus Christ and his birthday than by giving him the best gift. Otherwise, you probably need to apologize to God when you have gifts and say, God, I didn't love you enough to give you anything this, this year that's worth it. Those are harsh things, but let's, let's be honest about it. What kind of sacrifice are we will to make? The altar's open. I don't know what the Holy Spirit's speaking to your life about. But whatever He's doing in your life, you need to respond to Him. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the example of Jesus, how that he was that humble, loving servant who, who served his disciples and still serves us. And that he cleans us completely if we're willing. So God, today I pray you just help us to embrace this idea and, and help us to, to take the life that we're living and the truth that we know and put it together so we don't have to keep experiencing the pain of the difference between them. God, I pray that we learn the path to a truly blessed life, the track, path to humility, the path to living a life that's worth anything. It's by serving other people and most importantly serving your cause. So God, I pray that this blesses time. Move with your people. Move among them. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand as we sing a verse of invitation. The altar's open. Won't you come?
but I, I tell you, I appreciate Donnie. Uh, Donnie actually uh, drove down to Siler City with me yesterday morning uh, to pick all the boxes up. Seth Mountain Air did it right. I'm not joking. They, they had a set. They had a set up uh, at their plant. Uh, we rolled in. They were packing boxes on one side, loading trucks up on the other side. We literally drove in, drove out. I mean, we were there a matter of maybe 20, 30 minutes max. Uh, they had it. They had it. They had it right. I tell you. But I appreciate them. I appreciate them giving us the opportunity. I thank Donnie for going down there with me, helping me with that. We came back here. Uh, I didn't know some of these roads existed in Seagrove until Donnie showed us where they were. Uh, and at one point, it felt like we were on road at one point. Uh, so uh, it was fun. Uh, I was in my work band, so it didn't matter to me. Uh, we'll, we'll go for it. Uh, uh, but uh, I do appreciate him. And, and, and on that point, yeah, yesterday was a busy day. I had a lot going on. Uh, but I was able to sit back and actually remember what it is to actually serve our community that's around us. I know one of the one of the families that we visited yesterday, uh, Donnie drives the little kid's school bus. His name was Mason. And I and we got back in the van and I was like, Donnie, you, you made that boy's day. Uh, his bus driver just uh, came out and uh, and was able to give something to them as well. Uh, uh, but that's what it's about. It's about the stories behind the, the ministry work. If you have not been involved in ministry work, I encourage you to do it. Uh, to do that, to do the do, uh, you know, the, I encourage you, if you haven't been a part of any of the ministry here at Maple Springs, I encourage you to do that. Uh, step in, step out of your comfort zone and step into one of the ministries. When there's an opportunity, hey, if you don't know everything, if, if we don't do a good job of explaining that ministry to you and, and how you can help, hey, come to me. Come to Brother Bill. Uh, come to one of the ministry leaders that's here and, and ask them, know, ask what you can do. But get involved. Uh, the heart of serving, that, that's a big part of the sermon series as we went uh, forward. So I appreciate that sermon series we've been on. As far as another announcement, uh, we are having a business meeting tonight. Uh, part of that business meeting tonight is the nominated committee. Uh, their presentation of uh, different offices and, and, and jobs and everything within the church. That is a fact that if you have not seen that, pick that up before you leave because we will be discussing that tonight. And also back there is the budget as well. We won't be voting on that tonight, uh, but that budget is back there for you to start looking at. So make sure you grab those before you leave. Also back there on that very same table is the prayer guides. Make sure you grab one of those. Uh, number one, we'll talk about it in a minute, uh, that you keep up with the prayer request uh, and, and praise reports as well and all the different stuff. But also it has a calendar in it. Uh, that is, that's, that if, if you want to know what ministries are going on, that calendar is kind of important because it has some of the big dates in it, uh, and then also uh, some of the other dates that you can write in as well. Uh, so make sure you grab one of those, uh, uh, and don't forget the, Chris, the church-wide Christmas party that's coming up on December 10th. If you haven't signed up for it yet, sign up for it, and make sure you get the monies to Ms. Judy March back there. She'll handle that uh, as far as getting everything taken care of. And if you are attending, don't forget that you will need a $10 wrapped gift that night. Uh, uh, nothing else on it, just a wrapped gift uh, and, and a, a wrapped $10 uh, price tag. I'm going to bring that for that night as well. Uh, as far as any other prayer requests, I mean, any other announcements, if you ever have anything, make sure you hand them to me, uh, and, I'll, and I'll try to get them in or at least get them on the calendar for you and make sure that the right people know about the right things. Uh, but just make uh, use me, uh, use uh, Brother Bill, uh, getting some of those things out. And also, uh, prayer requests. I mentioned that a moment ago. Get your prayer guide so you can keep up with it. Uh, 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 and also, don't forget to use the website. The website, uh, that way you can put them in there. And, and not just the prayer requests, but also the prayer reports. We have so many uh, within the church that are sick, uh, that are dealing with illnesses, that are dealing with, with all kinds of different issues, whether it's uh, testing or whether we're waiting on an outcome or something. We have so many of that here. You need to keep track of it. I have to. Uh, with my mind, uh, it don't work all the time. So i got to write them down. I encourage you to do the same thing. And that's what the prayer guides, that's what the website is. And also you can go to the Facebook page, uh, the family page, and leave them there as well. And then, of course, like I say every week, if you're not that technology person, that's fine. That's okay. You can just jot it down on a piece of paper, drop it in, offer it like today. Uh, that way we can get in, uh, into those uh, certain places so we can all pray together as a church family, as a body. I mean, we are a, we are a family here this morning. 
I appreciate you coming this morning and being a part of the family. Um, uh, before we get into uh, the office and tithes, I do have a, uh, and like Brother Bill mentioned ago, we are getting into the lighting of time, and we have a short video for you to watch this morning. We don't see points on a map. They aren't just places to us. We see stories of lives living without the hope found in Jesus. Today, somewhere between the Great Commission and the Great Multitude, we find ourselves facing the world's greatest problem, lostness. Even in the midst of natural disasters, humanitarian crises, and political instability, Southern Baptists send IMB missionaries to give their lives to the lost, living amongst those who have never heard the gospel. People in hard to reach places, people in cities, and those who are dispersed and displaced around the world. At the IMB, we believe that missionary presence cultivates gospel access. Gospel access that knows no geographic or social boundary. We believe that missionary presence fuels gospel belief, and we see the results. We see lives transformed, generations forever changed, and churches planted. Local expressions of the church that take ownership and thrive. God has made our purpose clear. Together, we seek to take the gospel to every nation, to all tribes, to all peoples, to all languages. We don't see places on a map. We see our place in fulfilling the Great Commission. This is our mission. This is your mission. And we are reaching the nations together. Now, some of y'all might not realize uh, the Lottie Moon. I know it was years that I was actually coming to Maple Springs, and I never actually knew what the Lottie Moon Christmas offering was. It's the International Mission Board. That 100% of your giving to this mission, uh, to this offering, goes to the missionaries. And the cool thing about this, it, it, I know they briefly mentioned it, it, you're not just giving to a certain point on the map. You're not just giving to a certain missionary, even even though you are, but, but you're really not. Because what you're actually giving to when you give to the International Mission Board, you're giving to the stories. Think about it that way. You're giving so that they have those stories to share, that they're able to reach those people groups that, that might not be reached any other way. You, you give to some of those, the corners of the world that are not seen by most people. That's what you're giving to. You're giving to the stories. And most of all, you're giving to the Great Commission. So when, when you give to the International Mission Board, when you give to Lottie Moon, you can be assured uh, that we make sure and, and that the, the Southern Baptists make sure that 100% of your giving, it doesn't go to the upkeep of the program. It doesn't go to any of the officers or anything uh, that is involved with the International Mission Board. It goes 100% to the missionaries that's on the field, that's out in the field, that are, that are having these stories with the individuals, that, that, are, that are in the corners of the world that we might never even reach uh, as an individual myself. But they're there. And they have stories, uh, and they're fulfilling the Great Commission. Uh, that's why we give to Lottie That's why we give to the International Mission Board. Uh, so with that said, uh, as, we, as we close out today uh, with our celebration, our offers and tithes, I, I want to share, uh, I'm going to share the exact same scripture I've shared for the last two weeks. Uh, because because it, it dawned on me this week when I was thinking about this and, and when we were sharing uh, with some of our community, the Thanksgiving boxes and everything, it, 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 it finally clicked in my head why we do what we do. Uh, but the scripture is in Romans, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Uh, we all know this. Therefore, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So our offers and tithes. This is what finally, this is what clicked in my head. I've known it, but it never just clicked in my head until this week, really. I'm not offering. It, it, it is, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's the money that we give. 
uh, to the church, to the cooperative program, to Southern Baptist, to Maple Springs, so that we can reach the, uh, the community around us. So yeah, the money is part of the, 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 our, our gifts. It's part of it. Our gifts, that, that, uh, the, the gifts, the, the, the godly gifts that he has given me. My spiritual gifts, yeah, that's part of it. My talents is part of it. My time is part of it. But what it all comes down to, you're the offering. You're the offering as you walk out today as we celebrate our offerings and tithes. And I'm going to close with this last thing. Happy Thanksgiving this week. May God bless you this week. And uh, uh, may you be around your family this week and just have a blessed time. Let's hit it in a word of prayer. We do have service tonight and we do have a business meeting tonight. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for today. Father, we thank you for each and every day that you give us. But today, you've set aside time for us to come together as family to worship you. Father, we thank you. Father, I thank you for the family time this week. Father, I thank you for the time right now that, I've able, that I'm able to come in here with my family, my entire family, your family. Father, we thank you. Father, as we leave out today, uh, as we celebrate our offering tithes, Father, may we realize, may it click in our minds that, you know what, I'm the offering. That's my true and proper worship. I'm the offering. Whether it's, whether it's, 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 it's the money that's in my pocket, Father, whether it's my time, whether it's my talents, whether it's my spiritual gifts that you give me. Father, it's all yours. I'm the offering. Father, help us to remember that as we walk out this door. And Father, help us to remember that as we walk out these doors and go out into the world. Father, that we should have a servant's heart as we leave. No matter where we are, no matter what we're into, Father, have that heart, have that mindset. Father, we thank you and we love you. And we ask all this in Christ's name.